Hi, this is Brian Wormers from the University of Sioux Falls recording uh, a lecture on the second half of this PowerPoint slide covering COPD. So COPD is a condition that includes emphysema and chronic bronchitis and what it signified or what its underlying cause is destruction of the alveoli and then that leads into ineffective gas exchange, air trapping, gas hunger, and increased work of breathing. Cigarette smoking is the biggest factor of this, um, leading into 80 to 90 percent of COPD deaths. Alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency is also a risk factor for this, and of course asthma is another risk factor. So the pathway is kind of similar for the two of them, but for emphysema, you've got injury to the alveoli, which causes a loss of lung elasticity, and so hyperventilation, or sorry, hyperinflation of those alveoli, and then it collapses prematurely causing air trapping, ineffective CO2, O2 exchange, and then non-oxygenated blood enters that circulation. With chronic bronchitis, you've got exposure to inhaled pollutants, um, and that can cause inflammation of the bronchia and bronchioles. That uh, wall thickens, causing obstruction, and leads into increased production of mucus, and that leads into more plugging uh, and obstructions. So with this, some of the subjective assessments of this is going to be, you know, do they have a history, risk factors for age, gender, um, occupation, around any petroleum products, those kind of things. Uh, history of smoking, history of breathing problems with cough or sputum production. History of shortness of breath uh, with activity. History of weight loss or of edema. Objectively, we can see that some are going to be thin, stooped, and in a tripod position. Um, some might have a barrel chest, some have cough, um, there's cyanosis, dusky appearance, delayed capillary refill, and a finger clubbing, some activity intolerance, rapid shallow breathing, abnormal breath sounds, or they might ha even have some cardiac changes of tachycardia, edema, pallor, and cyanosis. There's often anxiety and fear when you can't breathe, and so those are common as well. Realize that some of these are more common in emphysema, and some of these are more common in um, The chronic bronchitis. However, in some patients, there's overlap between them. It's not always a clear definition that this patient's got emphysema or this one's got chronic bronchitis. So just be aware of that. Labs and diagnostics. So we might do ABGs, looking at the hypoxemia and the hypercarbia. Um, that may result from this. Realize that with this, it's it's a problem on getting air out, and so they they're trapping this, and it gets they become acidic because of it. Um, so they get a chronic respiratory acidosis. Um, you might see a sputum sample looking for infection um, just to see if there's something that's triggering this. Uh, with that infection, WBC is commonly done. You might look at H&H &H to determine if there's any polycythemia. Um, this can be a secondary finding for this as your body's trying to compensate. So if your body's not able to get enough oxygen, well, maybe if it gets more oxygen carrying capacity, maybe that will help that tissue. Um, be able to have adequate supply then. BMP, CMP might be done for any electrolyte imbalance. Might do a chest x-ray to rule out any other patho pathology with this one. Uh, but what you're going to see is probably some air trapping and, and distension. Uh, pulmonary function tests can be done with this one, especially if you're looking at the FEV1, uh, looking at the force expiratory volume in one second. Planning and implementation, so hypoxemia is very common with this one. Um, so with these side effects of, of these type of things, but our goal is to improve oxygenation and decrease CO2 retention. So what do we do with that? So our interventions are, you know, monitoring closely, of course, oxygen rates, trying to get them between 88 and 92 uh, percent. With this, we don't want to go too high. If we put them on oxygen and we get them up to 100 percent, uh, remember, in this case with the COPD, their drive for respiration is changed from the CO2 into oxygen. And so if they've got enough oxygen, you might decrease their, um, their drive to breathe, and that can cause complications as well. Additionally, they might have some diaphragmatic respirations or do some purslip breathing, trying to keep those alveoli open. Positioning upright, so getting up to sit 
in a more upright position, um, doing some coughing and exercises and, and increasing pulmonary toilet, um, which is just a fancy word for their, their breathing. But trying to increase those excess of secretions by coughing and getting some of those out. Drug therapy, we can use a couple of different things with that. So we can use beta adrenergics. So like your albuterol, we can use cholinergics, and antagonists, xanthines, corticosteroids, chromiums. Um, but with any of these, if we're talking about, you know, use of inhaler, make sure that they have adequate treatment with this. Um, I've seen multiple times where they didn't get good education on this, and then they had a hard time understanding how to do it or did it incorrectly. Also, realize that if they don't have good coordination uh, and, sen and sensation of this, they might it might be very difficult for them to use a puffer. Suction as needed, hydration, thin those secretions, even use uh, use of a humidifier may thin those secretions out a little bit. Might do vibes, um, so they might have a vest that they would wear or use a device to try and break up um, and, and do some mucolytic, uh, mechanical mucolytic uh, treatment. Um, another goal is with the COPD patient to achieve and maintain body weight. Um, oftentimes we see with, on one end of the spectrum, they are losing weight. They're having, they're burning so many calories just trying to breathe that they are um, losing weight. In others, we see that they are overweight and being overweight can um, make it more difficult for them to breathe. So what are we going to do with this one? So identify those patients that are at risk, of course, refer to dietitians as needed, manage that dyspnea in order to improve eating. It's going to go both ways. Um, so we need to make it easier for them to breathe so they can eat. We also need to give them proper food with enough caloric intake so that they can use that and convert it into energy so they can breathe. So select the foods, sometimes, you know, those that are easier to chew, non-gas forming, don't contain caffeine, those kind of situations are better for them. Decrease, um, you know, patients with COPD can have a lot of anxiety with this. If it's difficult to breathe, that's a very scary thing for most people. And so we can talk about that and figure out some factors that increase uh, anxiety and then uh, work to facilitate the, the change of that. Develop a plan so they know what to do. Encourage support by family, friends, and counseling. And then consider alternative therapies, um, just trying to reduce anxiety. They might have increased activity evidenced by being able to maintain SATs, which would be a great goal, perform their own ADLs, and engage in family work, social activities as desired. So things that we want to do is energy con conservation might be a key with this one. Try to get them to group their cares and to rest in between cares. Um, not talking too much uh, during activities and saving their breath and saving their energy when they're going throughout their day. Uh, patients with COPD, you know, hopefully they avoid serious respiratory infections because that will make COPD worse. So try to encourage uh, immunizations against pneumonia and influenza and COVID. Uh, avoid cow, uh, crowds. Uh, hand washing, of course, is going to be in a nursing lecture. Seek some medical care if they have signs and symptoms of infection. And then, of course, treat it. So, patients who PED is prescribed a long acting inhaled beta 2 agonist, reports hating the, that the inhaler and asks why the drug can't be taken as a pill. So, why do you think this is? What would your response be? Is it A, B, C, or D? All right, so drugs taken by the inhaler work more slowly and remain in the system longer. Um, not necessarily. Oftentimes, it's, it's a direct treatment to the affected tissue, so it can work a little faster. Um, have no side effects or less expensive well everything's got side effects so you can rule out the no side effects um, taking my mouth are more expensive because it must be sterile not necessarily it's not sterile by any means it's uh, it's clean hopefully and then drugs taken by mouth have systemic side effects that are harder to control and that's definitely the case so if we're talking about long-term uh, 
steroids, those that are um, throughout systemic throughout the system, you're going to have lots of those nasty side effects. And I know this is talking about beta 2 agonists, but for uh, those and for the steroids, your side effects are worse, and it's harder to control those side effects. So that would be the correct answer. So, all right, this concludes this part of the lecture. If you have any questions on it, please contact me.